Okay. <laughs> you think you have it all well planned. <laughs> and then the day it comes around, <laughs> you realize it's still going to be a little bit of chaos. So welcome, everybody. I'm Kelly Bliss. I'm Katubadine Lauren's stepdaughter. And uh, I'm hosting this little memorial. Uh, time to remember, uh, remember my dad. Um, there'll be lots of opportunity for people to speak or share a thought or a poem or a song. Um, but what I wanted to do first was share um, a short kind of um, casually written obituary that um, is incomplete. That's all I can say about it. You, it's really hard to summarize uh, a life this long. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there are um, pieces that you will, you will recognize. There probably everybody knew my dad in different slices of his life in different times. And so this is just a little bit of uh, from beginning to end that I wanted to share. You hit a lot of the main points. I did look at it. Did you say something, Lauren? Yeah, I said you did hit a lot of the main points. I did take a look at it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you to see it first. All right. Same. Actually, you had a couple of things there that I didn't even realize, so oh. or have the details on. So. Okay. Can everybody see the picture? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So as I said, this is an incomplete history, but some highlights of a life lived fully. So uh, Ketubedine Lauren Rue Smith was born on September 29th in 1936 in Tacoma, Washington. And here he is with his mother, Laura Lockwood, his father, Rufus Smith, and little baby Lauren. Um, he grew up through high school in Arcata, California. He was the eldest of three boys. He had uh, a, a brother named Bruce and uh, still living his brother Donald up in Alaska. Lauren kept several paper routes to feed, keep food on the table for his family when he was young. He finished high school and attended college to earn quite a few credits over time. Uh, his first marriage, let me scoop up to here. Here's his uh, first wife, uh, Tranquil. They were married in 1957, and his first son, also named Lauren, was born in France, where they were stationed in, in the Army. He uh, did three years of military service during the Korean War, from 55 to 58. I'll go back to this picture. In addition to working in a warehouse, Lauren trained drill sergeants as a private first class because by being a professional singer, he knew how to use his voice safely. He traveled frequently with a barbershop quartet and entertained the troops. Uh. All right, let's go to this one. After an honorable discharge in 1958, Lauren moved his family to Oregon and finally settled in San Jose, California, where his second son, Colin, was born. And this is um, him with his son, Colin. And I'm missing all of the pictures of San Jose. I couldn't get to them. So this is kind of a bit of a skip here. But um, he met Bakhti, my mom, around 1968. And they married a few years later and continued to live in the Bay Area. In the early 1970s, Lauren added Ketubiting to his name. It has various meanings, but mostly axis or pivot of the faith. He participated in the Cosmic Mass in San Francisco with Pierre Valiat and Ayat Khan. Yeah. And I was a little girl, so I remember going to all of the rehearsals. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Our home in San Jose became the Sufi Center of the South Bay and was called Manzil Muhabbat. Ketubiding and Bhakti led Sufi dancing for several years and continued the tradition after moving to Grass Valley, California. He loved the mountains, working with his hands, building, gardening, raising goats, living off the land and walking in amongst the pine trees. 
He had various jobs over the years, including working in Silicon Valley as a systems analyst, a programmer, and a tech writer. He also sold solar power back in the early 70s, did landscaping, sold wood stoves, and worked as a roofer for a while. His son Colin died of AIDS during the epidemic in the 1980s. In 2010, Lauren moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico to be with his son, Lauren, and grandchildren, Jade and Gray, and his great-grandchildren. He um, was a member of the Desert Rose Sufi Center in Albuquerque. He survived throat cancer, which was quite um, an interesting experience for him because his throat and singing and voice were so incredibly important to him, and that is where he struggled with being able to use his voice. Uh, more recently, he was baptized at the Heights First Church of the Nazarene in Albuquerque, where he would sing the Lord's Prayer in a clear voice. Ketubedin's interests were many. <clears throat> Writing poetry, and we have one of his books. He had three published books, uh, two of them on his own. So he loved to write, po write poetry. He loved to read. He loved to go, in go into poetry readings. And his proudest piece of work was a poem titled Vietnam Paradox, which requires three people to read it. He published several books of his poetry. He always was very, very interested in religious searching and being a spiritual leader in Sufism for a very long time, always remaining curious, supporting others, maintaining an open mind and connection to God. It was always important to him to be in nature, to be hiking, climbing trees, or hiding in trees as he is here. I have a memory as a child where we would, any walk that we would go on, he was always walking faster and he would disappear up ahead in the path. And then invariably we'd hear a roar and we'd look up and he was up in a tree and come, come basically dropping down from some high branch. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, so we love being in nature, hiking, climbing trees, gardening, camping, lots of camping, and talking and singing to animals. As before, he, I said he also loved singing, playing with his voice, going high and low, playing a drum, and this glass pipe was one of his most treasured pieces. He's had it for many years, and it would take a lot of effort to get a, a clear note out of it, but he loved his glass pipe. He has singing bowls and always loved being in a choir. He loved working with his hands, woodworking, building, refinishing furniture. And my memory of him when I was a teenager would he be working really hard all week and then he would lay on the floor and watch football. That was his favorite thing to do on the weekend. But he'd never sit in the chair. He would lay on the floor and watch football. He loved to do crossword puzzles and jigsaw puzzles. He loved beer and wine, good food, and any type of pie would be his friend. He loved being with friends and family. This is one of his favorite images. It was uh, published in a magazine back in 2014. He loved this picture and you can see the walking stick there. So here's a close up of the walking stick, one of his, another treasured pieces of his. Dear friends uh, from San Jose, Dennis and Diana Collins. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's hard for me, you know, as a kid, I look at this and, and he was the last surviving of this four, of these four. My mom passed away two years ago and Dennis and I died recently. So uh, Ketubedin has now gone to join them. They're dear friends. He loved being with friends and family. So this is a picture taken in Grass Valley. I was a teenager and we have a uh, son, Lauren and grandchildren, uh, Jade and Gray, who would come and visit at the farm. And we have um, his uh, very dear heart soul person, Marissa, who was with him the last several years of his life as a strong connection. Being with family, this is a trip in, to Albuquerque. So we have the three generations, Lauren, Lauren, and Gray. Hi, everybody. <laughs> That's uh, Gray's uh, coffee shop, his first coffee shop. 
That's yeah. Crazy. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure where this is. Actually, Grace looks like your house. Yeah, this is in Grace's living room. Yeah. So, um, again, Lauren, his son, Lauren, uh, grandson, Gray, and granddaughter, Layla. This is one of the last pictures I took of dad. I was able to visit him um, uh, just a few weeks before he died and always loved animals. And there was a, a woman there who brought her dog and she had no idea he liked dogs. And so I said, please bring the dog over. He really needs to see this dog. So he was able to commune with the animals um, at the end. He survived by his son, Lauren, uh, myself, stepdaughter, Kelly, his grandchildren, Jade Gray and Benjamin, great-grandchildren, Jareth, Leila, and Finley, his brother, Donald, and his first wife, Tranquil. And he's predeceased by his second wife, Bhakti, um, his heart connection, Marissa, his son, Colin, and his brother, Bruce. And I wanted to um, put in the chat, there is a memorial page that um, one of the Sufi members of the Grass Valley Sufis posted. And so if you want to connect on that, I hope everybody can see that. Um, there's a memorial page. If you post something, he asked that just pictures only of Lauren and not of anybody else in it. You can post that. You just would send it to the, to the person who hosts the page. All right, not everybody's going to be familiar with Sufi dancing, so I thought I would just put a little, um, a little tiny clip of some Sufi dancing to watch just for a minute. You have sound? Are you not able to hear the sound? No. I couldn't hear the sound. No, no that's sound. weird. Sound. We couldn't either. All right. Well, I apologize for that. I'm not sure why you can't hear the sound because it was on my computer. All right. I'll try to. I'll try that again later if possible. But that was um, a recording of uh, uh, the Urs to honor our Sufi Sam Lewis, the annual Urs, and the call. The song was "May All Beings Be Well." So I'll try to. But that way you can at least have a visual for those of you who've never been to Sufi dancing. That mm -hmm. that was a huge part of of my dad's life. Okay, I would like to share some more pictures. Hey everybody. Okay, can you see the photos? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I'm hoping you can hear the music. No. <laughs> Oh, here's a, you can see these pictures, Sharon. Yeah. It's huge. Oh, my goodness. 
Yeah. 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 You should see these pictures. I only showed them for a flash. Hey, you sound just like me. <laughs> that's a family picture. That's that's Lauren when he was younger. He's had a beard for long hair forever. Uh huh. And, uh, it's okay. Him later, his beard turned gray. Uh -huh. And this is that's my mom with one of her husbands. And uh, that's Lauren. That's him. Haircut. That farm, my my that sign my brother painted for his farm. That was his boxy. That was his wife. That's the gal that's showing this is Kelly Bliss right here. Uh -huh. That was her mom. There's their goats. They raised uh, dairy goats uh -huh. and stuff. That was one he was a young one. He loved his goats. Well, he had his beard trimmed there quite a bit. Wow. They showed it completely off at one point, point Don. And where she got all these pictures? They're good at saving them, apparently. Mm -hmm. well, I am not. Oh. That was their farm. Building barn shed and stuff. He did. I don't know whatever happened to that arrangement. I thought that was awesome. But, mm -hmm. His son looks just like him almost. Oh, his that's son, his son? No, his son is right uh, right there, right beside him. Oh, okay. And uh, but when you see him up close, he's got There you yeah. go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank That's Lauren Jr. and his two kids, and that's Bucky, his wife. I don't know. Why they ever separated, I'll never know. Yeah. Both of them were too strong in the movie. Probably what the problem was. Brad Pitt. Yeah. Brad Pitt? I'm not sure who that one is. I'm not sure who that one is. And I don't know who that is. Oh, wow. Oh. Hey. Monkey looked up in the Sierra Nevada and on the farm. Yeah. Uh, that might be, uh, that might be Kelly. Okay. Grandson, that's a son in a grandson. 
Uh-huh. Nice time. Yeah, this is um, this is at the end. Right here. I've been using the VA hospital in New Mexico. Now we're searching. This is a Christmas ago, I guess. I don't know whose cat that is. That's him trying to do that. Doing an exercise? Shortly before he died. Shortly. Within a couple of weeks. That's a, that's a dog at the hospital. Uh -huh. A therapy dog. Uh huh. Right? So he just passed last December? He just passed a month ago. Oh. Two months ago. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's hard to curate photos. <laughs> There's so many. And I'm sorry it, it went a little fast, but uh, um, uh, there we have uh, a little snippet of Ketubedin Lauren's life. So uh, I wanted to invite uh, Tara, if Tara's here, to she wanted to play. Yep, I see. Okay. Tara is going to do a song for us. Thank you for inviting me, inviting us to share a song. Ubedin came to our dances at Universal Peace in Santa Fe numerous times, and um, I have that. I feeling. hear her. Hmm? You can't hear me? Okay, can I maybe ask everybody to mute themselves? Sometimes that helps with the sound transmission if everybody is muted. Let's see whether that... that um... Say something. It's a good kind of faint. That's weird. Weird. Well, oh, it's because you have original sound on, maybe? Do I have to have that on? I know, but that's weird. Okay, is it a little bit better now? Can you hear us okay? Okay. So I can hear you fine. I can hear you fine. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So looking at the slideshow of getting a feeling of a life lived with love and fullness and this feeling of going for it, and that's always the feeling I got when he when he came to our dances and our dance circle got richer because of him and his presence. And I'm grateful for that. In this song right now, the words are Yasha Kur Allah, Yahamid. And those are Arabic words for some of the qualities of God that speak about gratitude. And I'm grateful that Ketubedin was part of our lives, and I'd love to share that song, which is, um, I'm sure he, he danced it with us, because mm -hmm. <laughs> we've been dancing that song quite a bit. And I put the words in the chat, if you want to sing along at home um, without, keep muted though, stay muted. You're welcome to do that, of course. Ya shakura la ya hamid. Ya shakura la.
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tara. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Much appreciated. At this point, I have several people who um, were interested in in sharing. <laughs> so I wanted to start with Uncle Don to see if he'd like to share a few words uh, about his <laughs> brother, Lauren. Yeah, I just thought you guys, you did a very good job with this. You have pictures I haven't even seen, so I was pretty impressed with that. Uh, sorry, I was a little shy getting on there. I'm not good at typing very fast. I had a hard time getting it to come up. I had to update my Zoom to even get on. So, But uh, you did a great job on those pictures, Kelly. I missed the first part, but I, I saw most of them. So, And uh, pretty impressive. Uh, thank you all for showing up for this. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to come down, but uh, I live a long ways away. And uh, the last time Warren was up here, which was only about three years ago, I think, and we yeah. took a boat ride down to Kenai and hiked up to another small river and tried fishing. I had him went on a cruise out on the uh, Prince William Sound and saw every kind of every kind of animal you can see on the salt water i mean we it was it was probably one of the most exciting cruises anybody even the captain and the crew on the boat said it was the best trip of the year and it was a late late year it was the last trip of the season and and the water was great and we saw two different groups of killing we saw walrus i mean not walrus uh, sea lions and seals and otters and um, everything there was to see. We even saw goats up on the hills. We saw uh, a, a glacier habitate, and uh, uh, it was it was one awesome trip. A big, a big 
I guess, herd of dolphins chased us all the way into the bay and Resurrection Bay where Seward a lot is. And he, every time I talked to him after that, all I could talk about was coming back to Alaska. I couldn't believe what a fantastic thing it was. My mom lived up here for, our mom lived up here for 10 years and he never got up there when she was there and neither did I. I moved up here years after that. So I've been up here for most of 40 years. But every time I talked to him after that trip, for anything at all, he had mentioned coming back up here. I had to see more. He couldn't believe how beautiful it was, and and uh, it made me feel pretty good. But uh, I had a good time when I visited him in Albuquerque. I thought it was really pretty there and nice and totally different, totally, totally different terrain and climate and stuff. And and uh, Warren Jr. drove me around. We got to see a lot of scenery, and I caught a few trout that we had for dinner a couple nights and it was a uh, it was a lot of fun down there too so and i uh i couldn't believe that he, he the last bit of his life went pretty fast i'm kind of shocked that it did that because he seemed so healthy you know so uh, i i know i don't know most of you people and you don't know me and i understand but uh, i'm really nice that you all uh, showed up for this, and uh, Zoom is kind of hard to do for some people, and it is for me. I've been on it a few times, but it's been a couple of years, so it took me a few minutes. But really good job, Kelly. Really appreciate it. Thanks. For nice seeing you all, and uh, I'll let somebody else speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Don. <laughs> Lauren, did you want to say a couple of words? Well, I, you know, it's it's kind of uh, hard to talk about. You know, I'm still processing everything. Of course, it was pretty traumatic time going from his passing on Thursday and into the hospital on Monday with multiple heart attacks. Um, so it was kind of a wild time there. Um, so trying to go through and process, um, everything. In fact, I was on my way to go visit him when I got a phone call saying he had passed. Um, and, uh, you know, those the last uh, week or so, things kind of went downhill pretty quick. And so that was kind of, you know, it was getting harder and harder to have a conversation, to talk to them and so on. So it was kind of a difficult time. Um, but a lot of the many of the things that, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, he loved the outdoors. He loved animals. He loved singing. Um, you know, uh, I remember going down Coyote Creek in the South Bay area, a little creek that went through downtown San Jose and Santa Clara, uh, an 18 foot aluminum canoe in the backyard, which I still have. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, and, you know, um, doing the Sacramento River when I was in the Explorers, um, uh, with that same 18 foot canoe going through the rapids, uh, for prepping up for the annual canoe race. Um, you know, yeah, he loved the outdoors. He loved to get out there. He loved to be in nature. And I certainly is probably one thing that I have taken with me as, uh, you know, into my adulthood, that and, and music um, are things that are still a huge part of even my life. You know, um, it's been... Uh, an interesting journey because there are times when huge lots of time in my life that we weren't around each other when I went to school in England for instance and, and uh, 
uh, when I left high school, you know, and, and went <laughs> off with my own life in my own direction. So having that time when he came here gave us a chance to kind of reconnect and sort out stuff and uh, uh, who we were and kind of a chance to check in and and uh, so on. So um, it did happen kind of suddenly and unexpectedly in a sense, but at the same time, it wasn't without plenty of time to have that closure and uh, be able to say, okay, you know, we're there and we're ready to to continue. And so he went his way. He'd been talking about going home for a long time. And so that was really important. And although most people didn't understand, equated that with heading back to Grass Valley and Nevada City, which was some place that was near and dear to his heart, it was really talking about moving on. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand that. Uh, the people that were around him um, didn't understand that was what he was talking about. And so he took care of the things he felt he needed to take care of before he was ready to make that that final transition. So, I mean, yeah. <coughs> Miss him. But at the same time, where he needs to be, we move on. <coughs> that's all I have. Well, thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. your words and your memories. Marissa, would you like to to speak a little bit? Uh, yes, I would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I can stop crying, <laughs> I do cry very easily. So um, I'm going to read a short introduction that I wrote this morning and then read a poem. <clears throat> I am Marissa May, and I met Ketubanine Lauren in Grass Valley, California. We had a deep spiritual connection and had a friendship that lasted for 30 years. We were an inspiration and support to each other. He helped me with my work as a flower essence practitioner and making the sacred essence attunements that became my life's work. I helped him with his work as a poet and was the editor for the book we published called The Path to the Beloved. Today, I would like to read a poem from that book called We're Resting, which is on page 52. This poem was written when he lived at the farm on You Bet Road with Bakhti and Kelly. He was a gardener as well as a poet. He loved the earth and when he refers to mother, her and she, he is honoring his beloved mother earth Gaia. We're resting. I turned a spade full of dirt and another and another another year of gardening going deep into her breast. This is an acid soil colored by rusty iron. Each year I have fed it green compost, kitchen waste, some oak leaves, some barn refuse, and it disappears, simply disappears. I have no sign left of the tons of compost and manures I have fed her until I spade new ground and then I know. Newly spaded soil is so much redder. 15 years of composting has made a change, but mother is slower than my desire. She fruits in her time, not mine. Still there are dark harmonies for nose and eye and hand to know. Then the pastel flowering of spring, the golden hues of summer, and in fall reaping the ripened fruit. But now it is quiet. There is no color. A whisper of a breeze, clouds close to the ground and misting. 
we're resting. She and I, we're resting. And um, I wanted to say that, you know, my relationship with him was quite profound and as well as difficult at times. And um, the work that I do as a flower essence practitioner, I had probably done for, for quite a few years. And then when I met him, say 10 years into my, my doing flower essence therapy, I began to make, I was guided to make what I would call sacred attunements, particularly with places out in nature, out in the Sierras and other places, and also at special events, performances and music events. And I think that my work wouldn't, maybe this part of my work wouldn't have happened if I had not met him um, because I was on a spiritual path, but he really took me farther and deeper. And um, he made a lot of these essences with me and uh, it's, it's very special. And I'm also writing a book now about it. And um, so I owe, have a lot of gratitude to him. And I wanted to thank you, Kelly, for this beautiful honoring <laughs> and this beautiful slideshow. And I would have to say, truly, he is a lover of life, a lover of everything, of everybody. <laughs> and it's really there. So for a life well lived. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mukit, would you like to say a few words as a fellow poet, collaborator, Sufi friend? <laughs> yes, because I, I knew Kathubi once he came to Albuquerque, and we were good friends. We often went places, and at one point he asked me to be his teacher, but we really were friends than that. And... Uh, and, you know, it just isn't the same when he isn't there. Uh, it was always good having, it was always good being with you guys. I'm, some of you I hadn't seen before, and it's a pleasure meeting you. And uh, so Katubadin is doing another good thing, bringing us together. I'd like just like to share two of his poems. He'd often leave, ask me to hang on to extra backup copies of things. And uh, some two poems from 2016, Poems from One Soul. Soul 80, Meeting the Light. Light bearers, light, light bears not a false face. True self is God embodied in soul. False face is soulless, epic self. Uh, egoic, sorry, face, false face is soulless, egoic self. No fear when one is grounded in God. <coughs> The struggle reveals the true self. Whenever one takes offense, it is an action of the full sense. Return to the light within your breath. That is where your light meets the light. This one. Soul 82. Actually, this is from January 1st, 2017. The mirror of the night has the depth one needs when one is at sea in the expanse of an ego running at a muck in hell. At the edge of an ocean's stormy shore, the midnight blackness draws that turmoil on to that beach and the surety of a cleansing. Oh, that sky has had much relief written on its absorbing blackboard and the beach receives tears with a similar compassion. Landscapes and souls washed free of small cells into deeper heart, sense oneness, they return home. Healed for both then and now in God. We all miss him. But he's still with us in many ways. And thank you for bringing him in today. Thank you, Mukit. Those were good choices. 
<clears throat> Naja, would you like to say a few words? Yes. First, thank you, Kelly, for organizing this. Thanks to everybody who shows up today. Um, I met Ketubedin in 1974 at a Dances of Universal Peace meeting in the Santa Cruz Mountains, where I was living at the time. A friend of mine had already uh, joined the order. Uh, our order is now called the Sufi Ruhaniyat International. And he kept insisting I go to these dance meetings. At the time I said, I'm busy, I'm doing yoga. But I finally decided I better, I better go because I trusted my friend's judgment. And there I met Ketubini and Bhakti who are participants. And just about that time launching their own leadership in the San Jose Center. So there was a Santa Cruz Center and um, a San Jose Center at that time. Well, we became all very close because we were a fairly small population of Sufi initiates at that time. Um, and uh, Kelly was a little girl. I remember their cat. They had a beautiful fluffy cat in, in San Jose. And I do remember several several aspects uh, to Ketubadin's character. I, I remember him as tall and elegant in bearing. He loved to dance and move and sing, as we all know, and had this beautiful voice. Um, and he loved Sufi poetry and he lo loved writing poetry. Um, later, and I don't remember the exact sequence of events, he and Bhakti were asked by our Sufi leaders, um, Moinadine Karl Zhavlansky, the, who was the leader of the whole order at the time, to assume leadership of the Santa Cruz Center as well, because they went through some changes. Uh, so for a while, they were trying to operate on two sides of the mountain, so to speak. <laughs> I don't know if Kelly remembers that. Uh, but uh, he was an idealist, almost even a, a bit of a dreamer, and filled with love to everybody and, and all the uh, various paths he was pursuing. One thing hasn't been mentioned is he was also ordained as a Sharag, which is the ordained ministry track within our order. And I, I don't know if he performed a lot of ceremonies, but uh, he was certainly uh, capable. He, uh, you know, uh, you probably, those of you who uh, knew him later, probably don't know that he, he sent poetry to me too. <laughs> he would write and, and send out his poetry to, uh, I don't know how many people, but I was among the people who received them after we moved to Nevada. Uh, and we've been in Nevada for 23 years now. Uh, I, I have to admit, I lost touch with him after his uh, move out of Grass Valley and, and then moving to Albuquerque. Uh, but uh, there was something uh, soulful about him that I will always treasure, that he was willing to uh, uh, shatter his ideals on the rock of truth which is a saying we often hear in our path. I guess that's about it. Just, I'm one of the old timers. <laughs> Thank Been you. in the Ruhaniyat, as we call it, since 1974. Thank you, Najat. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> Uh, Michael, 
Did you have a few words you wanted to say, share? You're still on mute. There you Everybody, go. Uh, I'm a Grass Valley Tubidine person. Actually, you know, there's a couple things we weren't mentioned. He was he was also uh, in men's groups uh, later in a mankind project, and before and that's kind of think how I met him. I'm not sure it's been since '90, but I think one of the first memories I have is going out to the farm, and he would have a little Sufi thing that would just sometimes it would just me be me and him, but I remember his 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 fresh ground pancakes. In his, in his, in his, you know, his, his grain grinder and making pancakes and, 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 you know, I, I, I lived with Q, I call him Q for off and on twice, I think. I think he just stayed with me once and we were roommates once. But, uh, you know, he was, he had, we celebrated his 70, 70th birthday when we, when we uh, had a place together. And, he was an interesting roommate. Uh, we're both kind of private people, and we're both into the Sufi thing. And we led the dances of the Universe of Peace in Grass Valley together. Um, but Q, I remember one time going on a little retreat. I think it was a four or five day retreat. Got home, and there was a pot on the pan, glowing melted pot. <laughs> and I think he he got actually three of my pots over the years. So you know we were roommates and. You know, I was sad to see him leave Grass Valley. You know, uh, yeah. You know, I was in a men's group when he split up with Bhakti, and I, you know, I, I have my own opinions about that. I won't express, but Marissa was a wonderful person, and and, and I also kind of, you know, I have to say, uh, I tried connecting with him in the last ten years or so. I just wasn't able to, and and he would always send the poems, which I appreciated, but I just wanted to hear some little things about. Well, how's your life doing, Q? You know, what are you up to? Um, I do want to sing a little song because, well, first of all, you all know he's a very spiritually uh, deep person. And I do want to mention he had some works. Uh, he was doing investigations into the nature of light. before he, Just before he left Nevada City, or Grass Valley, and probably into where he moved, and, and I think they're important. So I don't have them. I have other books of his poetry that before that weren't published, but I think that that would be good to look into at some point. Um, he was really into Kuan Yin. And if those of you that don't know who Kuan Yin is, it's, it would be the Japanese or Chinese version uh, of, a, uh, of the goddess of compassion. He really loved Kuan Yin, and he loved that Kuan Yin song. We did that in the dances of the Universe of Peace and Grass Valley together. But uh, what I would like to sing for him, and just really shortly, is is, uh, is one of our foundation teachings, uh, the Heart Sutra. And it's Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva. And it just means going beyond, beyond, beyond where he's going, where he's at. Uh, but it's also beyond, beyond, beyond going deeper, deeper, deeper into your own heart. So anyway, here you go. Um, any more things about me and Q? I, I, I'm sorry I didn't get more proactive about Kelly about getting uh, the men's groups because I think I tried this morning, but we had two different men's groups. So there was two different uh you know, and, uh, groups of people that are doing pretty well over the years. And yeah, uh, I guess that's all I'll say about that. But he was, uh, he was like a father figure to me and a roommate and a spiritual guide. He gave me the name, um, which my Sufi teacher had never given me a name, but Ketubidin gave me the name Nirwali, which means light of the nearest friend. And anyway, I, uh, I won't. That's about all I had to say, but I want to sing Gate Gate, uh, and I'll just do a short version of it. Gate Gate Paragate 
Parasamprate Bodhi Svaha Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhi Svaha Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhi Svaha Till we meet again, Q, love you. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. You would have loved that song. <clears throat> so towards the end of uh, my dad's life, he joined a new church. And so there's a couple of people here who'd like to speak a little bit about that. So Pastor Tim, would you like to speak now? Yeah, thank you so much for uh, doing this and, and remembering Lauren. And uh, Lauren became uh, an, an important part of our community, uh, of our church at the end of his life. And uh, he was brought here by by Helen, who's also here as well, his neighbor uh, at his apartment building where he was living. And, um, and she invited him to church and he came and uh, he was just um, infatuated with um, asking questions. And, uh, and so we were, we spent a lot of time together reflecting on his life, uh, reflecting on, on the um, relationships that he had. And he always expressed gratitude and thankfulness for the people in his life. Um, and he did say, um, uh, as um, Lauren said earlier, um, he said he felt like he was coming home. And, uh, and in the end of his life, I had the opportunity to baptize him uh, as he responded to the gospel and gave his life to Christ. Uh, he sent me a poem uh, before he passed away, and I do want to read uh, a portion of that uh, to you because I, I, he sent me, as, as many of you, he sent me lots of poetry. I have many emails and, and lots of pages in my office of poetry that he sent me, um, but I, I wanted to read one uh, that he sent me specifically that we had questions on. Um, Beloved one, Jesus, I surrender. Beloved Jesus, I surrender to you. My Lord Jesus, resident of my soul, for there is nothing else I can do with myself, but serve you as I may, as I am, for I can be no other. Um, Lauren uh, found a peace in the end of his life, um, a deep peace in coming home, um, and he loved Jesus with all of his heart. Um, and found him in a very um, powerful way that was uh, a great encouragement to many of the believers in our church. And um, I was thankful uh, to get to know him, to spend time with him, and to, uh, to be a part of that journey in his life. Before he passed away a few days, um, before he had passed away, I got an opportunity to go and we took communion together um, uh, before he left. And uh, I believe that was one of the last things he'd ate, he ate before he, he died, but he savored, he savored that spiritual meal together, uh, with us. And he just put his head back and he said, I'm home. And, uh, and so it was, it was, a, a pleasure to know Lauren and to hear him, uh, again, many of the things that you mentioned, his love for, for nature and his love for, um, uh, poetry and uh, light. He and I often talked about light, uh, especially in relation to the gospel of John. So um, anyway, thank you for letting me share here today. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. And Helen, I think you wanted to say a few words as my dad's neighbor and friend. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I met Lauren in the hall of the apartments when I moved in. He had been here for about 10 years, and uh, it began a wonderful spiritual journey together in, in that last year. And uh, we shared 
our love for Jesus together. And I had asked him when I was, we were in the hall, I discovered he loved a lot of things I did, music and nature and all of the things we've been talking about and, um, and, and the poetry. And he began sharing that poetry with me. But um, I invited him to go to Easter Sunday service with me. The it was the first service he went. And that morning, uh, our cantata was on Jesus Messiah. And he just glowed as he worshipped, as, as uh, Chris Tomlin's song was sung during the Messiah, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel the rescue of sinners, the ransom of heaven, Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all. And as we began uh, talking and, and we often, our conversation was around the book of John because he began studying it as pastor said, and, uh, uh, and his poetry was on John. He had opened, he had his Bible opened and he added us uh, daily Bible readings to his daily practice, which he had practiced for years. And he would always say, um, I've loved and Jesus has been my, my brother all my life. But he came to a deeper um, and dug deeper into that relationship with the Lord as he uh, spoke John. He had a poem that he continued to write on called the search and somebody was talking and we talked about light. He always was talking about light, but um, he, uh, he kept adding to this and he said, my mind, my heart, my body sustained. And this was in spring of 1975. Yes. Sated. But what of my soul, even with definition provided a sense of continuance Assess a, a sense of an ethereal self and runes known indelibly, drawn from motion, danced before the dawn of intellect, knowing songs that trees and grasses sing, knowing great rocks that are reed bells for wind song, knowing the pure music of young waters, pining but homeward bound of her womb, the sea. Oh, yes, Father Sky, thank thee. But yet I am bereft and need ask of thee, pray thee, take thee my soul, open me and still the search. And he continued this on. And a lot of his search began in, um, I believe, in he told me 1975, when one of the Sufi leaders told him it, it was perfectly OK for him to look to Jesus and follow Jesus. And um, he ended with, uh, from John, he said, as John said, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is so in closest relationship with the father has made him known and is known here at the first church of the Nazarene. Seems I have come home. And then, um, I have several short poems he wrote on John. Excuse me, I've got to get a Kleenex. I miss this man living across from me. Um, two weeks before he went to, to the hospital, Lauren wept in my living room. He said he always had such a thirst for knowledge. And um, he challenged me. I had to look up many things and as we spoke together and his wonderful love of words. And um, as a 40 year veteran teacher, I had to often look an English certified. I had to often look up what words meant or people he was talking about. He had such a vast knowledge. And he said, this morning, I am about his work. I am urged by my brother Jesus to write about Jesus' food provided by him, who sent us his son, who is sitting beside me now. I am living in their grace, and I am near to dying, but I cannot, for there is much work, words, writing yet to do for the Lord. 
and the presence of Jesus in my life. He who is the Nazarene. And he had read this where um, John said, I have food uh, that where he told the disciples, um, Jesus said is um, that he would have, he had food for them and it was spiritual food. And two weeks before he went to the hospital, he sat in my room, my apartment and wept and said, Helen, I have so much to learn, but I can't see anymore. And I have trouble writing. And he said, I, I just need to learn more of God's word and know more. And my feelings are now he knows. And eyes bright with the love of Jesus are frightening and the supernatural can't be seen nor touched. But we know better. Such love as this is the greatest healer humans have available to us. To those who believe in Jesus and believe in prayer are sure to be healed in his light. And then if I can share one more. This is my endeavor and Jesus had made it easy for me as my companion all my life long since the fourth and fifth grades. Eternity is not easily understood anymore. The distance in the universe is for me, but I will never die. This idea still causes pause as opposed to dust to dust, dust to dust returneth. And this is from Jesus, whoever liveth believing in me will never die. This body will return if the establishment will allow it. It wants to return to the dust of origin. But my soul has another origin and also wants to return to that home that is the invitation of Jesus and his father that has no confusion for me, no clearer to de desire than wanting to go home from wherever it exists for me. Half my confusion of cosmic distance is simple. I can't count that high, even with a computer. My imagination refuses to say, I see for that distance for me simply cannot be seen. But believing in the essence is being at home with Jesus and his father. And perhaps my parents has a glow to it. I like that glow. It brings peace. You will never die. You will never die. How can we? We believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of our creator, God, our Lord, who art in heaven. I am that I am of him with my brother and image, Jesus, my Lord, who is resurrected from me and you and you and you. Sometimes this pen gets so heavy, I have to lay it down, take a deep breath and wipe the tears out of my eyes. These tears of joy and oh, these tears must will flow beyond now. And that those were some of the last poems that Lauren wrote. And I miss him, but I know where he is. And uh, he he tells us right there that he's he's with Jesus. And someday I plan to go meet him there. So we loved him dearly. Our church loved him dearly. My children, my grandchildren. And I want to say thank you to you, Kelly, and and to Lauren. Um he was so appreciative of the fact he got to see you. And uh, and Lauren was so great about coming at the spur of the moment, fixing, fixing last technological things as his body and mind failed. And it went quickly those last few months. Um, and he couldn't remember things. He was losing his vision. And, and um, he sometimes would just sag against the wall. He was so weak after church. And... Uh, he loved his family and 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 he wanted them all to know that and and i appreciate all of you for your support of him those those last few months because he knew you loved and cared for him and he was a very very special man of god thank you so much helen for those words so all of you who knew him, you all have his poetry, and it's in the thousands. I don't know what the actual number was, but it's a lot. 
so to close, I wanted to. Um, Forty nine thousand, by the way, or forty nine hundred. Forty nine hundred. Okay, we have a number. <laughs> Dad would like. That is, that's all part. That even that's a ballpark. <laughs> So I wanted to close in the interest of time. Uh, it's after uh, been an hour, but I wanted to uh, read just an excerpt, um, a poem that he wrote called As to the Soul of a Poet. Just outside my window is my teacher, that gnarless oaken branch awakens the sky, its sweeping arms bend to a wizened poet in a shower of golden leaves, bowing in gratitude as it tickles clouds. A laughter of rain freshens, breezes that take up the refrain. Another leaf comes home on the singing air. Listen. The birds too, finding the melody that the leaves spinning dance to, sing in their joy. I wanted to thank you all for coming and for sharing and for being a part of this and remembering Ketubedin Lauren and his and his life. So thank you all. I need to write. I want you. Again, Kelly, for doing a good job. Absolutely. I'm glad you could all come. Thank you for all the people who shared and spoke and sang songs, and it was great. Thank you. I, I.